All right, so today we're going to go over, okay, plant growth and development, okay? In other words, we're going to be looking at, okay, what are some things a plant needs to do through kind of its life cycle slash as it develops from, you know, being immature to being mature, okay? So that's what we'll be looking at here. So the key points are, first off, understand what factors influence the growth of plants, Okay. Secondly, learn what hormones are responsible for growth and development in plants. Okay. So believe it or not, plants, ha they make hormones just like animals do. All right. They don't necessarily have glands. Okay. Like we do, like we have an adrenal gland that makes adrenaline and a pituitary gland that secretes a whole bunch of different hormones, thyroid gland, okay, things like that. Plants don't have glands. Every cell in their body is, or in their tissue is capable of making all hormones. All right, third thing, understand the plant shape is not fixed, but it is a result of the interaction of environmental factors and growth responses. This one is kind of the big point for today, okay? And that is that plants do not have a genetically predetermined final shape. That's why you rarely see two plants or two trees side by side or even in a forest together that are identical, right? Not that you see two animals that are identical either, but, okay, the final shape of a human being is fixed, okay? We're gonna have two eyes, two ears, 10 fingers, 10 toes, okay? That stuff is all genetically predetermined. When, we're, when we are uh, you know, an adult, as long as we haven't lost any of those things along the way, okay, that's how many that we will have. And our final shape is determined. Um, but for a plant, that's not the case, okay? Case in point, that those two plants over there, they're genetically identical. I know that because they all came from the same plant, okay? I had one back in university actually that's how old that plant is it's older than you okay i had that plant and it gets too tall i cut it off and i stick it back in the ground and it just continues to grow from both parts right so those all of those plants in there i know are genetically identical do they all look exactly the same no they don't they have different numbers of leaves okay things like that all right other things in the room here this plant here over on the windowsill okay and the plant in the green pail over there that we looked at yesterday are genetically identical, did the same thing. Grew them from cuttings of the same parent plant. All right, this one, look at it, it's all grown off on this side. Like there's no growth on the other side of it, okay? Whereas this one over here is quite a bit more even all the way around. If they're genetically identical, how come they both don't look like that one? Yeah, well, and actually because I mess with them. Not just the, it's, but yes, it is because of the light sources. That one, I never turn. It sits the same way all the time. So it only receives light on that side. That's why it grows that way. This one, every time I water it, I turn it about 30 degrees. Then the next time I water it, I turn it 30 degrees again. I'm constantly making it grow in a different direction so that it'll grow evenly around on all sides. All right, so their final shape is more a relationship or an interaction between their genetic code and the environment in which they live. Okay? Plants have to adapt more to their environment than animals do. Okay? For an animal, if their environment changes and it's a negative change, the animal has an option plants don't have. They can leave. Okay? They can just get up and walk away. Okay? This isn't the Lord of the Rings. Plants can't do that. Okay, they're not just going to up and walk away. Okay, they can't. They're stuck there. They have to adapt their structure, their shape, etc., to the environment in which they live. All right, questions on that so far? All right, so like we were just saying here, plants are rooted to one location for life. Okay, and so a plant generally responds to environmental cues by adjusting its pattern of growth and development. That's why like all spruce trees in a forest grow up, okay? That's where the light is, so that's the direction that they grow. Um, if you get them on a hillside, they don't all necessarily grow straight upwards, okay? Um, sometimes one can get knocked over, okay? Like this one did here, it's kind of hard to see in the picture here, but this tree right here grows like this, okay? Why would a spruce tree grow like that? 
Yeah, it got knocked over by a rock slide. Okay, I mean, it could have grown out like this if it wanted to straight out like this. It would have got the same amount of light. It would have been fine for photosynthesis. But eventually, if it kept growing out at an angle, it would have fallen over. Okay, plants also have a sense of up and down. And this is a kind of a balance reaction to gravity. It tries to grow back over its roots so that it can distribute its weight properly. Okay? And plants can get some pretty funky shapes as a result of um, basically what's happened to them during their growth. Okay? So the program for development in a plant is somewhat plastic. That means it can be reshaped. All right? um, because plants of the same species can vary a lot in their body form, much more than do animals of the same species. Okay. Making sense so far? All right, so a house plant on a windowsill will obviously grow towards the light. Okay, we call that positive phototropism. All right, and we'll talk about phototropism later, but phototropism is growth towards the light source. Okay, that's a smart thing for plants to do because light is their source of energy and helps them to make food. So it would be smart for them to orient their growth in that direction, even if it's as simple as just turning their leaves in that direction. And that's what you can see here from these, uh, I think they're alfalfa sprouts or something like that. Okay, they've just, they've, they're growing bent towards their light source and their leaves are facing the light source, top side facing the light source, right? There's actually examples of plants that will show negative phototropism and that is ones that are in sunlight or has a, have a light source that is so intense that it's actually hurting them. They will actually grow away. Okay? They'll try and grow towards more of a shadier area. It's very rare. Okay? The, the light source has to be ridiculously intense. All right, so in a forest or natural ecosystem where plants are crowded, phototropism directs growing seedlings toward the light that powers their photosynthesis. That is gonna be controlled by the plant hormones that we're going to talk about, okay? Because if a plant's going to grow, its growth is going to be controlled by chemical messengers, just like yours and mine are, okay? So while we use, you know, like human growth hormone uh, to help us grow and things like that, um, plants have similar hormones, okay? And they, they would have similar effects on them. Okay, so there's five classes that these hormones are going to fit into, okay? And they are each concerned with either a, an environmental stimulus or a type of growth the plant needs to exhibit. Okay? In general, there's two types of growth a plant exhibits. Primary growth, which is the lengthening of the plant, and secondary growth, which is an increase in the girth of the plant, right? If all a plant does is grow upwards, and gets and stays really really skinny it'll topple over in the first strong wind okay so as a plant grows primarily upwards it also has secondary growth outwards okay all right looking at this picture here with these little alfalfa sprouts okay almost all of the sprouts are growing off to the right what's wrong with this guy well maybe Well, actually, it does have to do with light and trying to get into it. Okay, for this for this plant to catch the light, let, I mean, the light source is obviously like here. Okay, so if we're looking at kind of the the light here, okay, that it would project for this plant to get into the light, the shortest route into the light is actually backwards, upward at, at a diagonal, as opposed to he's at the back of the crowd here. Right, if he tries to grow this way, he'll have to grow all the way over here in order to get into the light following the others, okay? Growing upward here at an angle is actually less growth to get into the light, okay, for that particular sprout. So natural reactions sort of the things, okay, or finding alternative light sources. There could also be a reflection off of something in the back here, okay, that could be giving it um, that sort of ability, okay? But in general, we see that most of the sprouts are growing in the direction of the light. Okay, first type or class of plant hormones are called auxins. An auxin is any hormone in a plant that results in the lengthening of the plant. So pro, uh, responsible for primary growth. Okay, so auxins will stimulate the elongation of cells. It won't make more cells. It makes individual cells longer. Okay, and it does that in young developing shoots. So that would be, um, you know, at the top of a plant or even at the tip of roots. Okay, these cells are getting longer because of the action of these auxins. Okay, so auxin can be used to also make plants develop fruit 
without being pollinated. All right? Anybody like seedless fruit, like seedless watermelon, seedless oranges, seedless grapes? Okay. I mean, it's a pain in the neck when they got seeds in them. Right? So we like these seedless fruit. Well, the way we make these seedless fruit is we actually um, spray them with a very dilute solution okay, of actually what is normally a herbicide okay, um, onto the flowers. And it triggers a chemical reaction that is the same chemical reaction pollen causes when it lands on the flower. Right? So the plant thinks it's been pollinated and goes through the whole process of making fruit. But since there was no actual pollination, there was no like meeting of sperm and egg, there's no seed. Okay, So it builds a fruit without any seed. All right? So we kind of chemically trick them into doing that. All right, another application of auxins is as a herbicide. Okay, And we do that by essentially overdosing the plant on a synthetic form of auxin. Okay. And so um, it's like it's got too much of the hormone and it'll actually grow itself to death. Okay. How many of you have seen what like dandelions look like after they spray them in the in the summertime? Right? They get all like coily and long and stringy. Okay. That's because they've been sprayed with 2,4-D or Killex. Okay. Um, Killex is essentially a synthetic plant hormone. Okay. It's an, it's an auxin, but it's synthetic. Okay. And it makes the plant grow faster than it can sustain the growth. Okay. So effectively it just grows itself to death. Okay. It's almost, it, we essentially give it cancer okay? and, it, and it just grows itself to death and dies. Okay. It can't support the growth with its ability to carry out photosynthesis and acquire water and nutrients from the roots. Okay. So if you look in here, like this is a, a normal plant, the one on the left, you see, it's got a very healthy root system and very little above ground structure okay one that's been sprayed with more auxins it's got all above ground and very few roots okay so as a result you're trying to sustain all of this foliage with almost no root structure okay and that's what usually ends up killing them right so this chemical was actually developed quite a long time ago okay one of the first places it was used was here this is before and after Back in the mid to late 60s, early 70s, okay, in Southeast Asia, there was a war going on in Vietnam. Okay? The big problem with this war was, well, it wasn't popular, to be certain. Um, but secondly, the big thing was is that um, the Americans were fighting an enemy who was well entrenched in their own territory. Okay? They had um, a system of tunnels they could hide everywhere because it's the jungle okay there's lots of places to hide in the jungle okay and american forces had never been in a war like that they didn't like the fact that you know their enemy could hide anywhere and just ambush them at will so they said we got to do something about all the cover that the enemy has right so they tried napalm but it, you know you can burn a section of forest with napalm but a tropical rainforest is pretty wet so the fire goes out okay things like that they said we need something that's going to take out huge swaths of rainforest so that the the enemy can't doesn't have a place to hide so the cia says all right we're on it okay they come up with this chemical they call agent orange for obvious reasons okay you spray it on something green and it dies Okay. They had these specially equipped helicopters that would fly over the jungle and spray this stuff. And they had on the side of the helicopters, painted on the side, Smokey the Bear. Okay. Remember what's Smokey the Bear's saying? Only you can prevent forest fires, except they didn't have the fires. Only you can prevent forest. It was a sick sense of humor. But okay. they, that's what these, these guys' job was to spray this stuff all over the jungle and kill it off. Okay? And then there was nowhere for them to hide. And with all the rain and storms and stuff that would happen, okay, uh, the soil would get washed away because the plants had died and their roots weren't holding it anymore. So there was a lot of erosion and stuff. It was really nasty. The environmental effects were far beyond anything they anticipated. Uh, in addition to the fact that they sprayed everybody who was there too. Okay. They thought, oh, this chemical just kills plants. No big deal. Except that it was really harmful to the people who lived there, their own soldiers who got sprayed with it, farm animals, all of it. Like they, they had huge inc incidences of cancer okay, in these areas because 2,4-D is just nasty stuff. Okay. So it can be used it, in, like any other hormone. If you get too much of it, it's bad for you. All right. That's why we say, you know, you shouldn't take steroids. First off, it's, you know, it's immoral to take steroids. It's cheating. Okay. And secondly, 
taking steroids is going to end up being very bad for your body because your body's trying to get rid of excess hormones of whatever kind you're taking. That's hard on your liver. Okay. Um, but it also affects the glands that normally produce those hormones. Okay. Well, not so much these ones. Oh, well, just because they develop gigantic muscles. Yeah, they look unrealistic. Thi yeah, they can get hypothyroidism as well or hyperthyroidism. Uh, all kinds of bad things can happen. Uh, but if you're taking testosterone, for example, okay, um, if you're injecting yourself with testosterone, the level of testosterone in your body goes way up. And so the glands that normally produce it continually get a message from the pituitary saying, hey, stop. Like we, you got way too much of this stuff in, in the body. Stop producing it. And the message they send back is, we haven't been producing it for a long time. And they keep sending that message. And the message keeps coming back that we're not producing it. We're not producing it. What happens to the glands that normally produce it? Yeah, they shrink. Think about it. They shrink. Yep, that's exactly what happens. Okay, yeah. Not only do they shrink, they may become permanently dysfunctional. Think about it. Not pleasant, not a good side effect. Okay, um, This was kind of all discovered back in the early days of using steroids and kind of the 80s was kind of the, the early time of that, you know, like Ben Johnson, those kind of guys. Um, and there were also a lot of women who were taking the steroids as well. Um, like Florence Griffith Joyner took lots of like anabolic male steroids. If you take male hormones and you don't normally have male hormones in your body, they cause male effects. You don't grow any new structures. Okay. You know, think about that, but okay, you'll get secondary uh, male sex characteristics, increased hair growth, um, larger muscle mass, um, deeper voice, things like that. Like you could tell she was on the juice. Okay. She looked mannish. We'll say okay, by the time. Same with the East German swim team. Okay, they were one of the worst ones for getting caught back in the day. Okay, um, the East German women's swim team. Yeah, they were very, very mannish <laughs> because of all the anabolic steroids they were taking. Had these hulking muscles. Okay, yeah, it just didn't look very natural. Okay, all right. So the effect of having too much of any one hormone is bad. Okay, you're supposed to have a certain amount in your body. If you have more than you're supposed to have, there's going to be negative effects of that. That's true for plants as well as animals. All right, so auxins, the big thing for them, elongation of the plant. That is the cells get longer. Okay, they make the cells get longer. All right, then there's cytokinins, okay? Cytokinins promote cytokinesis, that is cell division. So this hormone doesn't make cells longer or bigger, it makes more cells. It actually triggers cells to reproduce and to split more often, all right? Now, if that's working properly and that hormone is present in, large, in like normal amounts, then that plant is very healthy because it's constantly replacing old or sick cells, okay? So it's constantly got this supply of new cells coming through, okay? Which is why there are many plants that can live to be hundreds, maybe even thousands of years old, okay? The oldest known like organism on earth, like actual living organism on earth is this, is the Methuselah tree, okay? It's somewhere in California in one of the national parks, okay? And it is over 5,000 years old, okay? Now can something live that long? Because it's constantly producing new healthy tissue. Right? Doesn't work as well in people. Okay? They did animal tests okay, with using this hormone on, on animals, and what do you suppose it causes? Yeah, exactly. Rapid cell division. Okay, uh, so it, you know, as long as it's present in the right organism and in the right amounts, it works just fine. Okay? Uh, so what this one does is it stimulates cell division. So cytokinins stimulate cell division, and that helps the plant to replace old, sick cells. Okay, with healthy ones. All right, gibberellins have a number of jobs. They actually have a wider range of effects than the other two we've talked about, okay? Roots and young leaves are the major sites where gibberellins are produced, but their effects are actually in different places.
previously missed any updated Okay, so while auxins affect the ends of the plant, okay, they affect more like the tips of the roots and the tips of the shoots, okay, gibberellins affect more of the stem itself, okay? And so what we see there is that if we have too much gibberellins, plants will become tall but very skinny. Right, um, and this happens a lot in rice paddies, in like in in Asia. And okay? when they're growing rice, some have you ever seen what a rice paddy looks like? Like the rice is basically grown in a flooded field. It grows right out of this like murky, muddy water. Okay, they call it flood irrigation, and it grows right out of the water. Um, so the there's a because there's so much moisture, fungus is prevalent. Okay, and if this if a particular fungus grows on the roots of these plants. It triggers the overproduction of gibberellins, and the plants grow really long and skinny, like you see on the right, instead of what they should look like, okay, which is on the left. Right? This is what the Chinese call foolish seedling disease. Okay? And it's caused by it's caused by this fungus that makes gibberellins produce too much. The plants get tall, but they don't get any secondary growth and they just fall over and die. Okay? And it can cost them, uh, you know, large amounts of money and food if those rice patties get infected with this with this mold, essentially. Okay, so gibberellins, okay, they stimulate not only cell elongation, but they also stimulate cell division. But again, are focused more in the stem than anywhere else. Okay, another thing that they can cause is uh, clustering. Okay, gibberellins can cause the clustering of um, like blossoms and things like that. So in a normal, uh, normal uh, like tomato plant or grape plant, okay, what we'd see is you know blossoms and leaves that are fairly regularly spaced, and we would see fewer fruit. Okay, but something that's got more of the gibberellins, we see okay that there's more blossoms. Okay, the fruit tend to be you know a little bit bigger, and in grapes more clustered as well. Okay, I mean. This is fruit is a place where you can really see the effect of um, like the use of chemicals on plants. If you compare like organic versus non-organic, you can you can quite you can really clearly see the effect that increased fertilizers and stuff like that has on the size of fruit and, and the kind of quality of fruit and stuff. Yeah. All right, abscisic acid. Okay, abscisic acid is again a hormone produced by plants. Okay, but it's most important in plants that have to go dormant at some point during the year. Okay, this hormone effectively um, interrupts the production of chlorophyll. Okay, so the presence of this hormone or chemical in the leaves, okay, disrupts chlorophyll production. Okay. So we know it's present when the leaves start to turn. Okay. Because we know there's no green in them anymore. Chlorophyll is not being produced. The reason a plant does this is that not only does it want to stop photosynthesizing, but it wants to stop the movement of water as well. Okay. If the plant's not carrying out photosynthesis, water won't be transported to the leaves anymore either because water won't be needed there. Okay, the stomates kind of close off, and then the uh, trunk and stem of the plant won't have water in it. Why is that important with winter approaching? Right. Okay. If you get a really hard freeze while trees and stuff are in like full growth, okay, you can sometimes see them break. Okay, the water inside will freeze and it will crack the plant break the plant. Okay, you see this happen in the fall always with tomatoes and stuff like that. Okay, they get frosted and their leaves just get all limp and they die. Okay, and that's because all the water vacuoles froze and the crystals are sharp and they break the cells. They actually puncture the cell membranes and the cells just spill out. Okay, that's why the leaves get all soft and limp and just the plant dies off. All right, so obviously plants don't want that. So as winter approaches, they start to produce abscisic acid. And that helps them to uh, essentially assume a state of dormancy. Now, what do you suppose triggers this abscisic acid to disrupt the chlorophyll? How do plants know that winter is coming? Well, they could use cold, but I mean, sometimes we get a cold snap in June or we get a cold snap in like early October or whatever. 
Yeah, exactly. It, all, it has all to do with light. Okay. Plants, when they really are in full growth, the days are longest. They get the most sun during that time. But plants know, they, I mean, plants have a sense of how much photosynthesis they're carrying out and how much sun they're receiving. When that number or that amount starts to decrease, okay, then they will start the production of abscisic acid. So as the days get shorter, okay, abscisic acid will be produced. The reason they use that is it's reliable. Temperature can fluctuate, but day length always changes predictably. Right? So it's a much more reliable source um, or trigger for this to happen. Okay? It's the same thing that triggers geese to fly south, okay? all of that stuff. They all use length of day as their, as their trigger. That's why sometimes you see geese frozen in the river. Okay? If we get like a massive cold snap like we did, and then and, you know, they, get, they haven't flown south yet. Right? They're stuck in the river because the days weren't short enough for them to go. All right, so what you can see in this picture here is actually a bunch of different study plants that have been given different amounts of abscisic acid. So these ones up here that have the flowers on them have none, okay? And then increasing amounts of abscisic acid all the way to this first row here that's effectively already dead, right? So, or it's gone dormant. Okay, uh, desert plants will also do this, but they do it opposite, okay? As the days get longer, they would trigger their dormant state, so they're dormant during the drought. Well, once the um, water starts or stops being sent to it, the cells inside die, right? And so it, the leaf just then falls off because it gets weak, right? Okay, ethylene. Okay? Ethylene is actually a gas, but we put it in with the hormones because it has hormone-like effects on plants. Okay? Ethylene is a gas that is produced by ripening fruit. Okay? Bananas especially produce a lot of ethylene. Right? That's why you don't want to put any other fruit near bananas. Because if you do, it'll ripen and rot really fast. Okay? You ever notice that about bananas? Okay? They ripen and rot really fast. Okay? There's another corollary to Murphy's Law, but it has to do with bananas. It's called the banana principle. If you buy bananas green, you'll eat them before they're yellow. If you buy them yellow, they'll be brown before you eat them. It's true. Think about it. Okay. But it's because bananas produce a lot of ethylene gas, and ethylene causes the ripening of fruit. Okay, So um, what I used to do when I had kind of a bigger garden is I would pick all the tomatoes when they were green because I didn't want them to get frozen in a frost. I put them in a big box with a couple of apples. The apples would release ethylene gas and ripen all the tomatoes, and then I could make salsa all at once instead of having to wait for a long time. Okay. Because, yeah, you got to make your own salsa because nobody makes salsa, salsa spicy enough. Okay? They don't put like five jalapenos in it like they're supposed to. So, when you mash broccoli, when you make the broccoli, the broccoli is going to be the bananas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of a grayish yeah. color. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Honestly, I don't know what caused that, but I have, yeah, I've seen like bananas in the wild and they, uh, they don't look like they bananas just, in the store. Like yeah. Right. Yeah, more pleasing, appeasing to the eye. Yeah. yeah. Aesthetically pleasing. All right. So, um, yeah, ethylene gas can cause the, the ripening and the rotting of, of um, food items fairly quickly. In fact, a few years ago, they had this like um, TV ad for these special bags you could buy. Okay? And they were these green bags, and they absorbed ethylene gas. So if you put any produce in them, the gas that they produced would be absorbed by some chemical in the bag, and then the food would stay good for like weeks longer than normal okay I, they're, I don't I haven't seen them around anymore so there must have been something in that chemical that wasn't good for people okay but I mean the logic was sound they knew that ethylene gas caused fruit to ripen and rot quickly and they had found some way to absorb it so um, yeah but you can see the effects of that so ethylene causes the ripening of fruit and the senescence of plants so um, typically the fruit especially the on, on things like tomatoes the sepals um, which are the little leaves that are at the base of the flower and then are still present kind of on the top of the fruit, okay? Those produce a lot of the ethylene. So um, 
they trigger essentially the plant. Hey, look, you've produced fruit, you've made seeds. Now it's time to go dormant or it's time to die. Okay. If it's an annual plant, the ethylene gas will actually cause the plant to just die. Okay. It doesn't need to go on anymore. It's only growing for one season and it produced its fruit. So it's done. Okay. All right. Now, tropisms. Okay, so we talked about hormones. Now we're going to look at the essentially only three tropisms here. That's growth responses. A tropism okay, is a growth response that results in a curvature of the whole of a whole plant organ. So like the stem will curve, just like this picture here. Okay, so a tropism is caused is a, gro a growth pattern that results in a curvature. Now, this plant here is growing in response to gravity. Okay, plants naturally grow away from gravity. Because that's generally where they will find what? Sunlight. Okay. This is important if they're like a small sapling growing in a mature forest. They're not going to be able to tell where the light is because all the other plants will be blocking it out. Okay. So they're only getting a tiny bit of it and it's diffuse at best. So they rely on gravity to tell them which way is up and they will generally grow in an upward direction unless they get light on one side or the other of them and then they'll grow towards the light. Light's always the primary trigger for growth. Okay. Um, gravity is going to be a secondary trigger. Touch is a tertiary trigger. Okay? So we'll talk about those three. All right, so the mechanism for a tropism, okay, the way that a plant can make a curve like this is a differential rate of growth on opposite sides of the organ. That is, plant or cells on one side grow faster than the other. Okay, grow faster and longer. So which hormone do you suppose would be most important in helping tropisms happen? Which of the plant hormones we went over had to do with elongation of the cells? Auxins. Okay, so when we're talking about a tropism, it's differential rate of growth on opposite sides of the organ, and that's caused by auxins. So if you were to get a written response question on, oh, I don't know, a unit exam, okay, that showed a tropism happening and you were being asked to explain how this occurs, Okay. You would want to mention a lot of this stuff here. Okay, it's making this curve by having one side grow faster than the other. Okay, this is caused by auxins, so there'd be more auxins secreted to this side of the plant. Okay, making that side grow longer than the other side, and that causes this pushing effect that causes the plant to right itself. Okay. All right. Questions there? Okay. So that's kind of an important slide because that fits. All three tropisms that we will cover are essentially done this way. The thing that causes them is different, okay? But this is the mechanism by which they all happen. All right, so geotropism we'll talk about here. Geotropism is growth response to gravity, okay? Because geo means earth, so it's from the earth, okay? Uh, and can be seen in trees that grow on steep hillsides, okay? You can kind of see this trunk here is curved. Sometimes if a tree gets knocked over, but not like snapped off, it can almost be horizontal and stuff will start growing only out of one side because that's the side that gets light. It's also the side that's up. Okay. Um, and then again, we've seen this picture here before. Okay. Basically, geotropism is a response to gravity. How do you know it's gravity and not light that's causing it though? Um, well, sort of, but I mean, generally light is up, right? What you have to look at is, would the light this thing received change as a result of it being a certain way? So this plant here on the hillside, it could have grown out like this. It would have got just as much light growing this way as it would have growing this way, right? So it didn't grow in response to light. It grew so it wouldn't tip over. Okay? It grew back over that way. So you really have to look at the situation carefully and kind of analyze Hmm. All right. Is this thing, would light really have been affected for this plant, or could it have got just as much light if it kept doing that? Okay. If it could have got just as much light, then you probably it wouldn't have done that. Okay. Also, typically, plants that grow for phototropism like this, they just grow leaves off of one side. They just grow more branches. Okay. They don't try and turn the whole plant. So how come there's trees that have like they're on the flat ground, but they just go up a little bit and then they curve suddenly? Hmm. Yeah. I was just going to talk about that. Okay, so plants that have a weird like wow in their trunk, 
right? That's what you're talking about. I used to work at a golf course when I was in university and we had a tree like that, okay? We had a spruce tree that looked like this. I kid you not. Yeah, okay? So what likely happened, okay, was that when the spruce tree was a sapling, there was probably, because there was a bush next to it, okay? This like big bush here, okay? That bush and the sapling were probably growing at the same time, but the bush would have grown faster because typically deciduous trees grow more quickly than coniferous trees do. Okay, so that bush would have shaded the uh, spruce tree, so it would have grown this way a little bit to get back out into the light. And as they both grew, okay, it would have got around it, then used geotropism to go upwards or phototropism to go upwards, but then it would have started tilting, so it grew back over itself to balance. Okay. Yeah, and it could be that, you know, there was some sort of event like maybe a fire or something, right? So you would have had lots of fireweed and small shrubbery that would have grown right after the fire, and the saplings would have had to grow out from underneath that. And so that's typically why you see strange shapes like that. All right. Okay, so that's geotropism. Okay, phototropism we kind of already talked about. Uh, so we see in phototropism the growth of the shoots towards the light. Okay, and this diagram here is kind of showing you that on that other side we see longer cells. Okay, on the shorter side we see shorter cells. They're not getting as much auxins as this side is. Okay. This side gets more oxygen, so the cells are longer, and that pushes the whole plant in a curve in one direction or the other. Right, and the last tropism is thigmotropism, and this is growth response to touch. Okay, if you have any of that like coiled bamboo at home, okay, that that's caused by thigmotropism. If they want to make bamboo like grow straight and then have that like pigtail kind of coil in it, okay, what they do is they grow the bamboo, and grow, bamboo grows pretty quick, and they just tie it, they put a pipe beside it, and they tie it to the pipe. As it grows, they keep tying it to the pipe so that it has to grow around the pipe, and then when they want to sell it, they just pull the pipe out, and here's your coiled piece of bamboo that looks cool, okay. Um, ivy is another plant that shows a lot of um, thigmotropism. That's the stuff that grows up the side of old brick buildings, okay. It actually um, secretes chemicals that will dissolve the brick slightly so that it can get tendrils and hooks into the brick okay? and it'll hold on and it grows up the side of uh, buildings and things like that. Uh, peas and beans, okay? but especially peas, they put those little coils like yeah, if you're going to grow good peas you have to put a fence beside them and then they grab onto the fence and they'll grow upwards from there and you get lots of peas out of them that way. Um, another one is actually this plant here. Okay? I used to have this plant in my kitchen and on the uh, sides of it here, you see these little brown nodules, okay? Those nodules, if they touch drywall, they secrete a chemical that dissolves the drywall. And they'll put a tendril into the hole, and they'll grab on and they'll hold, okay? And it can actually crawl. I didn't know that at the time, and it was growing on top of one of my cupboards. And then when I sold my house and moved, I got up on top of the counter to pull this, to pick this plant up off and take it with me, and I pulled out a chunk of drywall this big, okay? it had grown like a whole bunch of tendrils into the drywall. And then, of course, the drywall had kind of gotten soft as a result. And when I pulled the plant away, a big chunk of drywall came out with it. Okay? So you got to watch certain plants. Um, isn't it also the plant that grows like hops? Hops, hops yes. Yeah. Um, uh, honeysuckle, same thing. Yeah, do the yeah. Oh, cool. Do you use it? Yeah, you should. If you got it, your own like wild hops, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, all right, so uh, thigmotropism is stimulated, again, by touch. Vines, tendrils, or even like nodules that can contain chemicals will allow a plant to grip something, hold on, and then it doesn't have to grow as much to support itself. It can use the object it's growing against to support itself, and that can allow it to get tall and receive more sunshine than a plant that's not doing that. Okay, so that's what thigmotropism, it's stimulated by touch. All right, give those questions a try here before the bell goes. We got about three, four minutes, so give them a try here. <laughs> 